on YouTube forever. Like, me, 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 me. La, 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 la. Hi, this is David Yang, and I'm here with our next installment of Alumni Stories. Today I'm with Christina Cologne. Uh, she's a recent graduate of Full Sec Academy. And let's get started with Christina, tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing before you joined Full Stack. Yeah, sure. Um, before coming to Full Stack, I was a stock analyst. So I wrote all the research reports with the stocks and the ratings and the earnings forecasts. I used a lot of Excel. Um, and I did a little bit of dabbling in programming while I was on the job. And that was sort of what uh, got me initially interested in programming and eventually led to Full Stack. So I always like to hear about like the origin stories, right? Like, um, and so one thing I'd love to hear about is how you fell into programming originally, and then how you fell into, or how you became um, came to know that you wanted to do programming as a, as a, a as a career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so going back to even even before my career in finance, um, when I went to college, my intention was to become an engineer, uh, and I pursued mechanical engineering uh, based on. No, for no particular reason, it just sounded cool. Uh, and uh, I was actually in a dual degree program, also pursuing a business degree, uh, just because I thought that that would be interesting to add. Yeah. Uh, it just seemed like a good idea at the time. And uh, from the mechanical engineering side, it just turned out to not really be a great fit. And about, I don't know, sometime in my sophomore year of the program, I just decided to lean into the business side of things because it, it felt like it was too late to switch programs at that point. There was already a lot invested on the mechanical engineering curriculum. Uh, and so eventually I find myself in a finance job. And um, while I was in, in that job, I discovered that you could program things at a very small scale to make life a lot easier for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it starts with a macro in Excel, and then before you know it, you're discovering Python <laughs> and uh, starting to make uh, little scripts with that that are you know, sort of growing increasingly powerful, but also like you don't have the discipline to really follow like good coding practices with any of this as you go along. Um, and in the meantime, uh, my, my real day job was still to like do the spreadsheets and, and write the reports. So. Uh, you know, more and more I felt like I wished I was doing the latter. And, uh, you know, certainly while I was in college, it, it felt like it was too late to switch gears when I was trying to become a mechanical engineer. But for whatever reason, you know, later on, I realized that it, it wasn't too yeah. late, um, especially now with all of these options like full stack that are cropping up that make it possible for people to sort of retrain themselves and like skills that are really in demand right now. And uh, you can start over. Yeah, yeah. no, I think that's. Um, I'm curious. In, um, you know, I'm sure in your mechanical engineering degree, you must have used tools like MATLAB or. Yeah. Um, what was the first program you wrote where you felt powerful? Like, like maybe it was a VBA script that yeah. saved you ten hours of work per week. What was the first program you thought? Yeah. Now this is why computers are awesome. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, I used a lot of CAD software when I was in mechanical engineering, and I thought all of that was really cool. But it mm -hmm. wasn't so much. You know, you were modeling things, but you weren't really writing a program that did something. Um, but the first project that I really enjoyed was actually on a CNC machine, where okay. we had to program it to like draw for us different things in like this um, block of wax. Okay. Um, and it was one of my favorite things that I did in that program. But it was such a small component of what we did overall. Um, and I think there wasn't enough of that to make me realize that what I liked was sort of configuring things and making them run and solving problems with that. Uh, I took a Java course in college, and nothing there really like lit the light bulb either. You know, we had projects and things, but it didn't feel momentous. And it wasn't until I was at work that I made um, a Python program to basically automate all of this data aggregation that I needed to do uh, in order to, you know, just put some things together for the companies that I covered. Um, that I realized just how far you could go with a very simple computer program. I just needed a problem to solve. That was like a real problem. And then I, you know, that was when I was like, this is really useful. It's like hiring another person. <laughs> like, so uh, let me paint this, let me see if I paint this correctly. You're sitting there yeah. and you're gathering data manually for a bunch of companies that you're covering yeah. for stock coverage. Yeah. And how did you, how did it click that you must have felt this kind of gap where I could write a program to do this. Yeah. And how did you get started? Like, what was the first thing that you did? Yeah, there was definitely a huge gap because the reason that I was doing all of this stuff manually for such a long time was because I felt like I didn't have the the skill set to automate it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, at one point I was talking to another friend who was a software engineer, and I was like, oh, like 
what would be like a language that would let me look at things on the internet easily? <laughs> like that was the that, that, that was, was the level I was at. Like, I was, I was like, I don't know anything. Oh, that's pretty um, articulately stated. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I need I need to get things from the internet. Like what would you use? And the recommendation was check out Python. Hmm. Uh, and it turned out to be a great recommendation because the documentation for that is so well filled out. Yeah. online and it's like a pretty intuitive scripting languages as far as these things go uh, and of course after spending as much time on JavaScript as we did here now I really love JavaScript too uh, but uh, it was that you know that was sort of what really planted the seed I just dove into the documentation and I started um, I think I still have the first program that I wrote it was something where like a user could input a number and it would return to you the double number <laughs> they would return to you the number times two and I was like wow like wow. <laughs> there we go I built a like calculator. a program right I built a calculator that only multiplies by two. That's um, very cool. But you know, like each successive one got a little better until I had the tools I needed to like, you know, connect to the internet and like make an HTTP client basically and then go out and like traverse the DOM and look for the things that I needed in there. So mm -hmm. you know, it's just it was a very incremental process. <laughs> Let me ask you a question that I've um so my, my wife is also a like in, in finance. And yeah. you have the distinct privilege of being the only project which I've ever shown to my wife that's made her tear up. So Aww. we'll go we'll get to that later. But um, just, you know, and I watch her work sometimes. And yeah. because she she's not a programmer, she will go and get 50 pieces of data and aggregate together in a spreadsheet to do some analysis. Yeah. And uh, now that you are a programmer, so I guess um, I think people who are, because they don't know how to program, yeah. they will do the manual work that I think programmers would automatically think I should automate this. Yeah. So now in your life, now that you've been on both sides, what's your threshold for saying this is something that I should consider automating in my life? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, the way I look at, so so while I was at work, the threshold was really low. <laughs> like I would, cause th that was how I realized I was into programming, right? It would be like, oh, like I have to do this thing and it will take me two hours to learn how to program this because I'm not a very good programmer yet. But I would rather do that than spend <laughs> 15 <laughs> minutes doing. like yeah. doing it by hand or, or yeah or you know and then feel like maybe in the future you know it's gonna it's an investment up front and then it saves you time like over time um, but yeah in my personal life I think it's more now like I I, I have like solutions looking for problems so mm -hmm. I guess the threshold has gone negative because <laughs> now I just look for projects that I can do with new languages or new frameworks that I want to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what, what drives that at this point. I was like, be like, I want to learn Ruby. Like, what can I make? You know, even if it's something silly like a to-do list app or whatever, I just want to try new things. That's kind of the stage that I'm at at this point. Okay. Yeah. I remember reading in your application that you used to do a lot of analysis of industries and yeah. you did a pretty interesting report on 3D printing. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, so you have a good mind for thinking about how technologies play in an industry, how industry will play out. Yeah. And I remember in your tech talk, you talked about TypeScript. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what are you excited about in the programming industry um, in general? What do you think is going to be, um, yeah. what, what would you want to invest your career in the next few years? Yeah, um, so one of the reasons I was excited to come to full stack was because you guys are on the mean stack and I see a lot of potential for that to keep growing. Um, and even if not as, as a whole, like more places adopting it monolithically, just you know, the potential for Mongo to create these really scalable uh, databases that respond well to sharding and, and, and these like high scalability challenges. Um, Angular on the front end, especially with Angular 2.0, um, Node for all of these event-driven websites. There are just like lots of little components within that that I'm really excited about, single page apps, yeah. uh, which, um, you know, I. I didn't really know about prior to coming to full stack, and now I'm like, yeah, this is <laughs> this is the way to go. Um, yeah, so and uh, TypeScript. Front, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious because upfront, yeah. a lot of students um, ask us why JavaScript, yeah. and you know, for a, a long time, I was, uh, you know, I programmed a lot of different languages, and it was, um, you know, it was an answer that we were kind of making a bet on. But now mm -hmm. we see things like even recently, WordPress just announced they're going to do a whole yeah. rewrite in Node and React. Um, from someone who was not kind of in the industry already, or just at the at the like thinking about it, yeah. what was the thing about JavaScript that seemed that appealed to you? Yeah, um, I was interested in pursuing JavaScript with you guys partly because it felt like, you know, it, it felt like an inflection point. In there, I was like, it's not 
it's not so edgy that you can't you know, find jobs for people after they go through the boot camp, but it's new enough that not everyone has embraced it yet, even yeah. if maybe some of these things have advantages that sh they should look at. Yeah. Uh, you know, just because your code base has a certain thing in it doesn't mean you should use it forever. There's just, you know, that's, that's, what you, that's the legacy code you have to live with sometimes. And there was so much about this that was, uh, I don't know, it felt, you know, it felt new and like it was sort of embracing change that yeah. seemed like a positive attitude to me and you know and then there was also um yeah i just i i liked that it was different i guess you know because there are so many places you could go to learn ruby on rails and there was really only one place to come here in new york city where you could learn to do stuff on the mean stack yeah. um, and angular in particular um and you guys talk about how um, by doing everything in JavaScript, there's less context switching for the students, and it wasn't something that I paid a lot of attention to mm -hmm. before I came. You know, in my in my process of evaluating it, but now having gone t through the program, I can definitely appreciate it um, because I've gone back now and tried to sort of, you know, look at some other languages so that I have more exposure to different things, and it, you know. It's, I can really appreciate now how nice it was to be able to learn frameworks and sort of learn all these concepts. And now when I go back and try to learn something like Ruby or Rails, I have something to map it back to. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have to worry about so many things changing at once, going from the front end to the back end before. Uh, and now that I'm more literate, it's a lot easier to do. It's a lot easier to have them, once you have the mental frameworks in place, it's a lot easier yeah. to map the things in different. Yeah, I think that's really powerful that even context switching for people who've been working in languages for many years is still a cost. So yeah. for beginners who are learning, it's, a, um, it's a just another toll to pay, right, yeah. to slow you down. Um, so I want to get into l a little bit about your full stack experience, especially yeah. around um, your, your tech talk about TypeScript, yeah. how you picked that, what, what got you excited about it, and also yeah. your project. So maybe we can start with, the, with your tech talk. Yeah, sure. Um, how did you choose TypeScript? TypeScript is one of those things where I'm a big believer in it. I think, mm -hmm. it's, I, I think it's the future, but yeah. um, I think it has some negative connotations. People think, A, it's Microsoft. B, <laughs> it's like, it looks verbose on the outside. So how did yeah. you pick it, and wh why are you excited about it? Right. So. Um, I think we have to look back all the way to, I think sometime during foundations, we looked at functional programming. There was a kind of a module on that, and we learned about what it is for something to be a functional program. And uh, my only experience prior to full stack with, was Python. So then I had Python and JavaScript, both of them uh, scripting languages with no type system. Mm -hmm. And when we started looking at functional programming, I started learning about some of the languages that are traditionally functional languages. So you can, you can use JavaScript in a functional manner, but it's not the way it was intended yeah. <laughs> to be used. Uh, and a lot of those languages are statically typed, um, Haskell being one very notable example. And I started playing around with those, being like, huh, like this type system thing is kind of weird, but I really <laughs> kind of actually like these type declarations because yeah. uh, they do a lot of work for you. And a lot of times it forces you to think about what your strategy is before you even write a function. Right? Like yeah. If you can't articulate what types are going in and what you expect to come back out, then maybe you don't have a clear <laughs> strategy. <laughs> um, and that happens sometimes, right? You're like halfway through writing something, you're like, wait, I, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know is what I'm doing. Is this an array, an object? <laughs> right, is it, an array? is it an array of arrays? Is it like nested three levels deep? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so that interest was in there. And then I was looking for a, a tech talk to do. And I was actually talking to Joe about it. And he was the one who suggested looking at TypeScript. Mm -hmm. um, Precisely because I think I think one of the things I suggested was like maybe I could do a talk on on type systems and like static typing because we don't have that in JavaScript. And he was like, I'll do you one better. Like, why don't you look at TypeScript because it has those things and it's applicable to JavaScript. And then it was like, wow, like, so, okay. this is really cool. Yeah. Um, so I installed it. I played around with it and. Um, you know you've gone pretty far down the rabbit hole when you start to geek out about error messages <laughs> because you go from undefined is not a function to like expected type number and instead got type string or type array of numbers, something like that. And you're like, wow, like That's this is so much is so much more helpful. Yeah. Um, and you know, whether you catch things at compile time or runtime, you know, whatever, like there's tests, so you're you're gonna catch it at some point, but it's that the, the specificity yeah. <laughs> of that error message just makes a huge difference. Um, and it, you know, it incorporates ES6, it's going to be used in Angular 2. It just has a lot of things that are going for it right yeah. now that make it, I think, like a very, you know, it turned out to be like a very practical thing to learn about instead of just a fun thing to learn about. Are you incorporating to any of your projects and saying, I'm only going to build this whole project with TypeScript? or? Um, I, tr I tried to get my capstone team to consider it, and in the end, we decided that we were, 
a little too stressed out as I was trying to learn about five other different new things that we needed for our project. And it just seemed like a lot to add it to the mix. Um, and I would have felt really bad if we'd had any kind of issue that was TypeScript specific <laughs> or related to some plugin yeah, for it. And then like, enough. yeah, it would have, the guilt would have been too much. <laughs> so, then, uh, so then we didn't do that. Um, but when I start at work now, I think I might give a talk on TypeScript. So it may turn out to be, you know, this thing good that investment. keeps evolving. Yeah, yeah, like a good investment and something that I can keep learning about and, you know, sort of spreading the gospel of, yeah. of TypeScript. I think it's definitely one of those things where we'll look back and be shocked that we gave it up for kind of, you know, rapid iteration, rapid development. But yeah. it's such a powerful tool for... Um, okay, that's a great segue into your capstone because when I think about capstones that I remember, yeah. Real cool, the capstone that you have, and we'll link to it in the um, in the show notes. Yeah. Is one of those ones that there were so many unknown unknowns going into it, yeah. and maybe you can give a brief description about it. We we'll talk about how you how the idea came to be, and what were some of the technical challenges that you had um, yeah. getting it done. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Where to even start? <laughs> um, so, real cool is an in-browser video editor, um, and the credit for that idea goes to Kathy who was on our team, Kathy Liu. She rounded us up and convinced us that this was something that was not only possible, but possible to do in two weeks. <laughs> uh, and the rest of us were like, sure, that sounds really hard, but I remember us, sitting there yeah. thinking, <laughs> they're going to switch to something else because this sounds impossible, practically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it felt impossible for a while, but I think the, y y we, none of us knew enough about video editing to truly understand how wrong that <laughs> like yeah. it was to even try to do that. Uh, I find that interesting that sometimes not knowing is what lets people even get started. Whereas yeah. people who do know, th those think that's like, not even uh, worth like trying. That'll never work. Yeah. 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 I'll just waste a week of my time and then we'll have nothing. Um, and yeah, we had a ton of challenges. Um, first and foremost, video in general is a really tricky thing to work with. You just have these huge file sizes, like latency becomes a huge issue from the very beginning when your user wants to upload something. Yeah. Um, there was the idea of doing it in the browser, which just is on another level, because usually these are desktop applications for a reason. They're using uh, a lot of your processor's power to do very specific things to encode and decode and transcode video, um, add effects, cut, like add audio, remove audio. Um, and we, like, I, I don't even know which one to pick because there were so many different things that we had to do. One was, um, one was figure out how we were even going to edit video, like, in the browser. Like, let's start with that, right? Like, the basic premise, um, there's a, a, a tool that you can use on the command line called FFmpeg, and mm -hmm. that's underlying a lot of audio and video processing that you, uh, that you see day to day out there, like, in some way, like, FFmpeg probably touched it's it. It's behind the scenes. Yeah, it's yeah. is behind the scenes, even if it's not, you know, like you're on iMovie, but you don't see it, that, that kind of a thing. It's behind the scenes. Um, and we thought maybe there's a way to integrate this into the browser, and then we can have it all in the browser. Um, that didn't work. Um, there are different ways you can try to go about something like that. There was, uh, we found one version of FFmpeg that had been compiled down to JavaScript mm -hmm. using mscriptm. Yeah. Uh, so that was something that we tried that was really bad for, for, for performance and the quality wasn't very good either. So we scrapped that and then we tried, I think you saw like this little hack with like HTML canvas where we would like take snapshots of the video and then do image transformation on those them. and then, right, and then upload the snapshots after the fact and then stitch them back together. And then that was a whole other level of, uh, it just, it was smelly from the beginning, yeah. you know, because there was just so much code and you had all these video elements, but then you were replicating it on the canvas and then you needed a way to sort of simulate a canvas on the server <laughs> after the fact to like stitch them back together. It just didn't make sense. And then what we finally settled on for that was um, we, we used the HTML video API, um, the web video API to, um, to reuse the video elements that people were uploading um, and just used our app to sort of toggle between videos that were being shown uh, and toggle between the start and end times and when mm -hmm. each video was coming up and what length of it we were playing back and then CSS filters for the image manipulation, which That's turned out to be surprisingly performant and powerful. Let me, let me ask you um, two follow-ups to that one. One is just something about uh, um, this path that we were on. Yeah. It was smelly. Yeah. So I'm curious how you like what's your intuition for that. And two is, as you're learning new things, because you, your team learned about F of MPEG, yeah. about web video, all the, all these new APIs, CSS3, yeah. you know, filters. Um, how do you kind of 
go about learning new things? Because I, I remember even you mentioned that you learned um, how to code Python on your own. So yeah. wh what's your what's your strategy for, for learning new topics? Yeah, um, the the big advantage that I had during Real Cool that I didn't have when I was learning Python was I had my teammates, <laughs> and we did a lot of pairing together. We would basically. Um, you know, show up on the first day of working on this project and be like, let's try to figure out today how to like upload a file and embed it in the web page so the user doesn't have to wait or something. Mm -hmm. Or let's um, let's try to get, you know, we would find some demo maybe that did the canvas thing and be like, let's try to re replicate what they did there and like do it here, like on our app and sort of co like concept testing, yeah, uh, sort of proof of concept that these ideas were working, and you know just try stuff um, and try it you know sort of in parallel I remember at one point we had when we were trying to do the canvas thing like all four of us were like independently trying to make <laughs> um, media source elements work remember we used the experimental media source API yeah. as well um, to solve a different challenge altogether <laughs> we were like all four of us in parallel like trying to get this thing to work because we couldn't find any working examples yeah. online um, well, that's and a good kind of mini yeah. microcosm of, of innovation right it's yeah. like you just gotta try forward and let people try different paths and see what works. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And as long as you're all kind of rowing in the same direction, like yeah. it, it, it works out and you support each other. I was really impressed by how it seemed like every time I would check in, you had all these little things working, and the next time you had reshuffled a bunch of them and some different things were working, <laughs> and, but you could see it kind of spiraling up towards the final goal. And oh, then, but when okay. it came to the, um, yeah. so wh what happened was that yeah. you know, when I was making the presentation on your project, mm. it was, I showed my wife that video. Yeah. And just the idea of kind of Instagram for video, mm -hmm. it would, it, she, I could see her tearing up a bit because uh, it was um, it was such a, a touching kind of random composition that we put together. So yeah. I was very impressed with the pro by the project. Oh, that's awesome. We're um, so glad that you liked it because we really <laughs> put so much into it and it was so down to the wire because yeah. as you said, like independently, like some parts were working, um, but it took us a long time to figure those out. And in the span of two weeks, like one or two days to figure out one thing is a really long time. Uh, so then at the end, it was like a mad rush to stitch everything together. Is there any thought that your team will continue working on it? Or is it one of those, it was awesome while it lasted and shelf it for now? There's ongoing development, but at a very reduced pace at this yeah. point. Um, I've added some things, Kathy's gone in and added some things. You know, I think we all understand that it's not going to be like, you know, like we all keep coming here and working on it yeah. together every day. Uh, but we were all really proud of what we got from it. Um, and actually, I believe Kathy's going to demo it again for um, a Women Who Code event. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we definitely still, you know, feel like a, a kinship yeah. with, with this project and are proud of what we did. Um, but at the same time, sort of the real world is, <laughs> is, is beckoning a little bit and we're all going to have to, you know, go to our nine to five jobs. Um, but, you know. So speaking of jobs, um, you recently um, gotten a job or are going to start a job. Uh, tell me about that process and um, how it went and you know, what, you're, um, what you're excited about the offer that you took. Yeah. Um, the company that I'm working for is called Hightower. Um, they make a SaaS solution for commercial real estate. Uh, and we connected over LinkedIn. Um, and the interview process with them was really different from other places. There was a lot of emphasis on portfolio work and it made me really glad that we here put as much stock as we did in our portfolio work and took it so seriously. Um, and they looked at everything. Mm -hmm. We looked at um, we looked at my stackathon project, we looked at um, real cool at, like at the actual code base. Um, we looked at my tech talk they had seen before I got there. Um, they, oh, they had to watch the one that you recorded here. <laughs> yeah, oh, <that's laughs> it was great. on my LinkedIn profile, so okay. so they had seen it. And, uh, you know, it was just very, like, I felt comfortable around them from the beginning, and I think mm -hmm. that the, the, the with the process having as much of an emphasis on portfolio work, I just felt so comfortable talking about it and going through my thought process on different things and uh, why things were set up the way they were or just walking through how one particular feature worked. That it just, like, you know, I think any full stack graduate who goes into a process like that is going to come out really well mm -hmm. um, because we take all of these projects so you know so seriously and like do you know spend so much time on them. And uh, what I liked a lot about the offer when I first heard about it was um, it was for a full stack development position, and that was something that I was interested in because as a as, as a new software engineer on the scene, I didn't want to go into a job that was way too specific on one thing because yeah. I, I realized that I'm still 
so new that sort of my talents and my interests could go in any direction still. Uh, so I like that this Why narrows down so early in your career? Right, right? like yeah. why, gets, why specialize so early? Uh, you know, specialization can be good, and you could argue we do have certain specialties here, right, like JavaScript. Um, but, but in terms of you know, my visibility into different parts of an application, I wanted to sort of be able to see it all. Um, I liked that the company was on the smaller side, 50 to 60 people. Uh, I liked everybody that I met. I just got like a very professional and warm vibe from yeah. everybody. Uh, and I, and I like the product vision. So I think that uh, all of those things combined just sort of made it a very, you know, very synergistic <laughs> <laughs> proposition for yeah, everybody. Yeah, very excited for you to yeah. be a career there. Thank you. Um, I'd like to finish off with uh, three final questions. Um, one, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's thinking about going to full stack? What are, you know, wh how should they prepare? How should okay. they think about it? Uh, how, how did you think about it? Yeah. So, how to think about whether to come to full stack? So, I'll go. I'll go a little bit through my process for trying to select a, a boot camp. The first decision is whether to go to a boot camp at all, and to decide whether you want an immersive experience or a, a flex experience or you know something more unstructured. Like, understand where you are in the journey and the level of commitment that you want to make. Yeah. Uh, another one for me was geography. I was already living here in New York City, and not all of my classmates were. Some traveled to come to full stack. Um, but I decided when I was looking around that there wasn't another boot camp, you know, near or far that I was, you know, significantly more excited about going to. Like full stack was so great. Um, and then. And then the other thing that I put a lot of stock in, you know, once I had determined like I want an immersive experience that's like structured and rigorous and in New York City, uh, was like I came here and I tried to meet people. Um, I spoke to Nimit during the interview process. I met Charlotte when I came in person. I even spoke to Shauna over the point over the phone at one point, and I it felt like there was like a good there was a good rapport with everybody, and like it was clear that you guys put so much effort into creating a good culture that mm -hmm. is welcoming and supportive and like you know curious but you know again like curious and ambitious but like supportive of one another yeah. that really rang true for me and was the kind of environment that I wanted to learn in and so it came down to you know sort of all of those things together um, and what did sell me at the very end was just being able to meet everybody uh, and of course you know from the first day that I was on campus I realized that you know, I had sort of made the right call in, oh. in that respect because everyone has been phenomenal. And well, I'm thank you very so much. appreciative <laughs> for everybody here. And that's very touching. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's very, very, I'm very touched. Okay. Now you're going to make me tear up a bit. Uh. <laughs> uh, second question I'd love to ask you is, um, what's your favorite full stack memory? My favorite full stack memory? Um, geez, it's hard to pick, you know? <laughs> One of them might be when we threw Becky Lee a birthday party. Oh, yeah. you know, Jimin bought all these uh, like little kid birthday parties and they had pin the tail on the donkey <laughs> and like streamers <laughs> and like a cake and party hats and all the stuff. And it was just like, this is like right in the middle of junior phase too. But it was one of those times where I felt like, wow, like my group is so, you know, people are so tight yeah. here. And so like, you know, we, we focus on our assignments, like when it's time to do that, but we also like to, you know, just sort of be yeah. <laughs> around one another and sort of share, you know, like look for any reason to, you know, to laugh a little and, and have a good time. Yeah. I saw a photo of uh, um, several students in your class during a Friendsgiving recently. Yes. Like, so, <laughs> um, it's, it's great to see that. I think it's very touching to see people kind of who enjoy a topic, but also each other. I think, like, as you said, it's very important. Yeah. Um, all right, well, Christina, thank you so much. Of it's course. great talking to you. And um, if you want to find out more about you or follow you online or see your work or maybe catch you in a tech talk, where yeah. can they find out, learn more about you? Um, sure. So I, hmm, I have a blog, but I haven't been keeping it very current. <laughs> uh, and that is at blog.cortadita.com. Cortadita? Corta, like, um, yeah. Uh, C O R T A D I T A okay. dot com. Okay, we'll add a link to it as well. Yeah, and um, I'll you know make sure you get my LinkedIn and my Twitter and everything for okay. the video description as well. Okay, and is you, are you gonna is there a schedule for your next tech talk? Are you giving one? Up? No, up um, I was hoping to go with Kathy to the real cool demo, but uh, I have a work conflict with that one. Okay. So um, you know, hopefully not too far out in the future, but um, none scheduled at this moment just okay. yet. Oh, well, we're very excited to see where your career goes. I think yeah, it'll be you. a you know stellar, stellar thing to watch. So, awesome. thanks so much for coming in. It was thank great talking you. to you. It was yeah, great seeing great you again.